The following presentation was recorded live in Las Vegas, Nevada for the 27th Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers. This is Tape 8, Voice 1. My name's Arden Hopkin. I'm supposed to know something about singing, and we're supposed to talk a little bit about how your voice works. Well, I can't help with that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know anything about chairs. I just know about singing. There's a couple of seats right in here. Yeah, that's good price. Yeah, there's a few more seats, but you know uh, there'll be another there'll be another session later on the next next period. I'm supposed to. Well, I hadn't intended it to be, but if it needs to be, it can be. What I what I'm going to do in this session is kind of run over the whole of the of what makes a, uh, the human voice tick, and we're going to try some stuff out and. Um, then in the next session, we're going to zero in in particular on how resonance works in the human voice and how to, to, to t change the color of your voice and the quality of your voice. And we're also going to take a closer look at how to get the range to go higher or lower. That's what's supposed to happen. But I'm going to touch on those two topics as part of this since it's a kind of an overview. This session is an overview. And so uh, it may be that if, if we do our job right, then the next session can be a, a repeat of this one so that we don't end up uh, not being able to breathe because there's no oxygen in the room left. Okay, well, um, yeah, the human voice is a real interesting machine, and you need to think about it as a machine. It happens to be housed in something that has feelings, and so we think that it's more complicated than it really is because our feelings are more complicated than they really are or that they have to be, I guess maybe I'd better say. But the machine itself is real simple. It has three parts to it. It's got a power source, and that's the wind-producing machine, and that's your lungs and the muscles that make your lungs work, the muscles that help you inhale, the muscles that help you exhale. We're going to look at those in greater detail, but th there's just a power source, and that's this part of your body down in your lungs and in your torso. Then there's a vibrator or a sound-producing part of the machine, and it's in the voice box or the larynx, right at the top of the throat, right at the top of the top of the trachea as the air exits out from the lungs. And then there's a resonator, and the resonator is a tube, a flexible tube, uh, that's your mouth and your throat and some of your nose, that's about seven and a half inches long. And depending on how that resonance tube is put together and matched and tuned, you get uh, different qualities of voice. And, and, and it's really quite simple, but in its simplicity is its complexity, too. And so I don't want to make it overly simple, but on the other hand, I don't think it needs to be any more complicated than it really is. You just have a wind machine. You put a, a vibrator in, in between it like a duck call. That your throat box is not a whole lot different than a duck call, except that a duck call only produces one pitch, and your throat has the ability to vary that pitch, intensity, and so on. So there... There are some things that your voice box can do that a duck, duck call can't. It can call other things besides ducks. And then you've got a resonance tube that allows you to change the color and to shape sounds into vowels and consonants so that they can be understand, understood in words. Okay, I'm done. Beyond the excess. Now we go on into the detail of each of those sections. Let's talk a little bit about the, um, the wind machine, the, the breath thing. And you'd think, well, I've been alive for a long time, some of you longer than others, some of you way too long, and some of you not long enough. But your system that breathes still works, and that's one of the reasons why you're still alive. It's pretty natural. It's a subconscious uh, a activity. And when you go to sing, you have to move that which is unconscious into the level of consciousness to sort of get it better, change the habits of your breathing, and then do it, persist in it long enough so that it will slip back on, back into subconsciousness. So that as you go to change your habits, whether it's to, uh, you know what, there's a couple of chairs sitting back here. Um, you know what, there's, a go steal them, go steal them, yeah. Oh, oh I, I see, she's, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Uh, you know what, we can make life a little easier here. I got more than my share of the room here. I'll just pull the table back. Now the last shall be first. If you guys want to get a chair, you can come slip up here in the front. Uh, but 
uh, how many of you ever thought about how you inhale and what muscles do it and so on and so forth? If you haven't, if, if you haven't thought much about it, those of you that got asthma, you've thought about it before. But the rest of you don't too much. You don't think about it. Those that have asthma know what it means to concentrate on getting air into your body. But your, your, your lungs are just sacs uh, in your chest. They don't have any muscle power in and of themselves. They can't do anything by themselves, literally, except exchange oxygen. And there are some muscles that work on those sacs to expand them and contract them, somewhat like a bellows. And I'd like to have you experiment with that. Would all of you imagine that you've got a, a big, thick milkshake and you've got a martini straw that you're trying to suck it through? Would you do that? By making this opening really small, you make the muscles of inhalation have to work harder than they normally work, so they draw attention to themselves. Would you do that again? And then I want, to, I want some response from folks as to what's going on there. Would you do that again? Inhale. Suck really hard. Work hard. Get it sucked. Okay, now what did you feel happening? Anybody? Any, any responses? A little bit of a feeling of panic. You're not getting enough oxygen. That's not the right answer. No, actually, actually that's the truth, that you don't get enough oxygen. Your body works hard and you get a little sense of panic. But where, we, where are you working? That's the question. I felt a little tightness right in these muscles right here. He's clutching at his heart. That's a heart attack, sir. I said, no. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. There are a couple of, at least one chair here. Are you holding that for somebody? You're hoping that it's a particularly handsome guy. All right. Um, he was clutching right here at the bottom of his rib, clay, rib cage. That's called your solar plexus, or it's got an epigastrium is another play, thing that it's called. Doctors call it that. It's the spot where your, your ribs sort of split apart and create a little triangle there. And it's the one spot where you can feel the activity of a very important muscle in your body, and that's your diaphragm. And the diaphragm is the primary muscle for inhalation. And so when you put your body under pressure, when you make your diaphragm have to work, you feel some vigor going on right down here in this area of your body, the solar plexus region. You may have felt it going around your rib cage. Did anybody feel it that way, like there was an expansion at the bottom of your ribs? Oh, she's raising her hand. Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, anybody uh, have any other sensations that were different than that? If you did, you didn't do it right. No, the truth is that the activity is low. Those of you that were doing that activity didn't feel the upper part of your chest rising at all because the muscles that control inhalation aren't up in the top of your chest. But how many of, the, how many of you and how many other people do you watch that when they go to sing, they go, and they, ra they take a breath and they raise the upper part of their chest? Well, they, do, they use back muscles to raise their chest as a means of trying to get more space in their lungs, more space in their chest cavity so that the lungs can expand. Well, it helps a little bit, but the real future, the real activity for breathing is down here in the bottom of your lungs. Okay, so would you do that one more time now that you know what it is you're doing? Inhale. Work, work. And you can feel that thing expand. A, a nice mental image is to think about how you fill a water balloon. Now, I know many of you haven't filled a water balloon for a long, long time. But just remember back to when you did. And when you fill up, you put the, the, the balloon over the nozzle of the faucet. Did the balloon fill up at the top first? No, it sags to the bottom and then it fills up. And that's the same way that your lungs should fill up when you're trying to inhale. While you guys were doing that, did you sense a distinct drop in the amount of oxygen in the room? <laughs> Everybody inhales all at once, and I found myself getting a little lightheaded. The, the second part of it, is, of this whole system, is how you get the air out of your body. If somebody were to punch you in the stomach, just imagine that right now. No, you just had lunch. Never mind. Let, let's find another way to do that. I want you to... Stick your little index finger up there and pretend that it was a pinwheel. You, you remember the little toy that you used to play with as a child called the, the pinwheel where you blow on it and makes it go around in circles? Just imagine you got a pinwheel sticking on your finger. Somebody here to take a picture of this? Yeah. <laughs> it's this finger now, remember? Okay. Now just blow on it. Now make it go real fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> How did you... What, what happened? 
what activity did you, what did you feel in your bodies? There's some activity down in that same place, some, some pushing outward or pushing inward? Pushing some, some contractions inward. Now let's do a fun little game. If you've been in my sessions before, you've played this game before. Everybody stand up. This is called the fat and skinny exercise. I'm going to stand on this chair so that you can get a good gander on how you play this game. I used to be a bit, I used to be a waiter, and sometimes the narrows would be, no, it'd be, you'd be carrying this tray of food, and then two people would be pushed out, and there's no walk space, so I go, ooh, I've got to slip through that, I've got to suck it in. But the story that I like to tell, which everybody relates to, is getting out of the shower, and you've got a side-long mirror here, and it, you take a good look at yourself and uh, sideways in it, and you see that part of your anatomy isn't where it belongs. And what do you do about it? What muscle? Oh, <laughs> everybody knows that feeling, don't they? Okay, now that just, just that's, that's the skinny part, okay? Now do the fat part. You all know how to do that, too. <laughs> okay, skinny and fat. Don't relate it to breathing yet. Skinny, don't relate it to breathing. Fat, just get a cadence going. In, out, in, out, in, out. Now the next time you go in, blow out. <sighs> We're all backwards now. Let's start this again. I was afraid of. Right from the very beginning, I could I could tell this was going to be a distinctive crowd. <laughs> Here we go again. Just skinny. Don't relate it to breathing, because when you do, you're doing it backwards. And fat. And skinny, and fat, and skinny, and fat, and skinny, and fat, and the next time you go skinny, relax, blow. Now raise your hand if that's backwards. One, two, three. I figured this was going to be the crowd that was going to break the bank. Usually there's about a third of a population. Y'all can sit down for a second. There's about a third of the population that sometime from the time they were born to the time that they become adults, they get their breathing patterns backwards. And there's about a third of you, maybe a little bit more this, in this particular room, who when, when you go skinny, you're trying to suck air in. And when you go fat, you're blowing your air out. If you were a newborn baby again, and some of you wished you were, I know, if you were a newborn baby and you were laying in the, in the neonatal ward, you would, everyone would be breathing. To exhale, you contract inwards. To inhale, you, you let your tummy go fat. You just go, go to the hospital and look at the way babies breathe. And you'll be able to see that that's the way that it's supposed to happen. Unfortunately, that isn't the way that it happens by the time you get to adult. And there's about, like I say, between a quarter and a third of the population that by the time they're adults, they get that twisted around somewhere either because their parents got it backwards and they just patterned themselves, or who knows the reasons. I, I'd be curious to, to see if there, anybody could figure out those reasons why. Those of you that get it backwards don't, doesn't mean that you can't keep living. It just means that you'll have a little bit harder time. It'll, you'll have a little bit harder time with singing because the way that you manage your breath has to do with the interaction of those two activities, the way that you inhale and the way that you exhale. So in inhalation, you've got some muscles that run right across, right across, a muscle that runs right across your body, divides it in half between the thoracic cavity, that's the upper part where your chest is and your heart and your lungs, and the lower part, the abdominal cavity, where all the viscera, um, your intestines and your stomach are. And that muscle, when it flexes, flexes downward. It's the only muscle in your body, in your whole torso that when it flexes downwards, uh, flexes, it pushes downward or it, it, it contracts downward. All the other muscles in your body contract inward and upward for the purposes of expelling air and the diaphragm goes the opposite direction. So the Italians have a hand gesture that goes like this. It, and this isn't going to mean much on the microphone, on the tape, but y'all that are here can see it. You can see it that I twist my hand and as I twist my hand, my lower fingers go inward and if I were to place my hand on my stomach with my thumb up near my solar plexus, that when I contract to exhale, my lower fingers go inward and my thumb seems to move outward. At the time that I inhale, 
the lower fingers down over my stomach expand and my thumb seems to go inward. So this rotating of the wrist with your hand, with your fingers spread is the kind of activity that should go on in your breathing patterns. In for exhalation, out for inhalation. And that's the kind of fat, skinny activity. Now, you, there's another way that you can find what it feels like to expel your breath. Would you just blow on the back of your hand real hard? So that you can't let the air out. You know, just compress the breath. Now, tell me what activities you felt in your body. The, the, ab the abdominal girdle down here at your hips and below your waist have a vigorous inward contraction when you're trying to expel breath. Anybody not agree with that? I'm surprised. I'd, that'd be another place where some folks get it backwards. But that, that contraction activity is, are the muscles of the abdomen. They're called the abdominal girdle. And they, when they contract, they move inward and slightly upward to put pressure underneath the diaphragm so that the air will be expelled out. And then when it's time to inhale, those muscles relax. The diaphragm flexes downward to give more space in the lungs so that air will come on in, and, and so you get that kind of fa uh, pattern. And sometimes, just to live, you don't have to do that very vigorously. But when you are either going to public speak or sing or sustain your breath in any kind of a way, to, or, um, yeah, public speaking would be just as much as in the singing. Whenever that happens, then you've got to put your breath under a more sustained exhalation. It's one thing to just be able to go or to not even work that hard and just go, huh, you know, just, just take a little bitty breath. But when you're really going to work, you've got to take a more vigorous breath and you've got to manage it over a period of time. And there are several ways that that management can be done. And I need several volunteers to assist me in this process. I need three volunteers to show three different ways that you can learn how to get that sustained exhalation. Anybody want to volunteer? Here's one, here's two and three. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, can I get you, let's see, your name is Rod. You know what, I, I lost my glasses the other day and I'm back to bifocal, so if I, I'm not trying to stick my nose in the air, I just can't read. So would you lay down on the floor? Right here in the aisle where everybody, y'all that are on the outside are going to have to stand up. On your back, on your back. Well, you know, actually... Actually, that's the truth. I got to—I just got to clean my shoe off here. I haven't stepped anything for quite a long time. Now, just—I just want you to—I just want you to breathe naturally, and when, when, when you'll notice that when he's laying down, that when he inhales, if he can quit giggling, that he breathes like a baby, probably sleeps like a baby. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, that's right. About the. 10 seconds into bed and out like a light. And that's because he breathes right. I'm kidding, but it's a nice story. But you can see that he expands into his stomach area and his ribs. Now, I'm just going to put my foot here right on his solar plexus and bear down just a little bit. Okay. Now, what I want, I've, I've put, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 pounds pressure on his, and I can feel, you can feel my, you see my foot rising and falling as, in he, as he inhales. And he is using a diaphragmatic breath. Now, without breathing, I want you to raise my foot. See, see that action that he just did? Now relax it. And raise my foot. He's not doing that with breathing because he's stopped off the breathing process. But the muscle that he's using to raise my foot is his diaphragm. That's a way you can find your diaphragm. Locate it. Okay, now relate it to breathing. Now inhale. And you, there's a big, vigorous inhalation. And he, you see, he raised my foot. Now, I want you to form an SH, and I want you to, to S blow that SH out, but while you're blowing it out, I want you to keep my foot up. Oh, no, that kind of thing. Okay, so it's, this is how you learn how to, con you get um, a sustained exhalation because you learn how to keep the diaphragm in its lowered, engaged position while you're, ex while you're exhaling, and that's a, not a natural thing to do. Okay, now form an SH. Now keep it on up there. Keep it up. Keep it on. 
He's doing really good. Keep it on up. Come on, come on, come on. Keep it going, keep it going, keep going. Okay, yeah. Now, go ahead and stand up, Ryan, if you can. <laughs> got, i got to ask you a question. Um, when you were exhaling that whale, I want you to tell the people what it was that you had to do to be able to keep my foot up. I had my foot on your diaphragm, so you had the diaphragm flexed, but there came a point where you felt like you were running out of breath and you had to make some adjustments to keep the breath moving. What did you do? I, I believe I pulled my stomach in. That's exactly right. Thank you. That's very good. Now, what happened there with Rod is that the diaphragm is actually uh, a, it's like an umbrella that sits in the, and the, the muscles and the tendons hook right here at the bottom of the rib cage and they, they go upwards toward the center. And in the upward center, there, th it's no longer muscle fiber. It's just tendon. It's a kind of like, like a trampoline flexible material, right? And so as he was trying to keep his diaphragm engaged in a low position, in order for there to continue to be pressure on his lungs, his abdominal muscles had to contract more vigorously, and that's what was going on. And as they did so, they took his stomach and his small intestines and so forth, and they pushed it up on the underside of the diaphragm, and that central bed of the diaphragm, because of the pressure from beneath, started to rise upwards, flexed upwards, while the rest of the muscle stayed outward. And that's that controlled um, that's the way that you learn to control your um, exhalation, is to learn how to keep your diaphragm in a low position. Okay, guinea pig number two. Come right ahead, Fred. Now, here's another way you can do this. You can, you can uh, get somebody, your wife, your spouse, your significant other, somebody that you trust implicitly. Fred, trust me. Now, I, I've just got my fist laid on his solar plexus. I want you to lean over on me, Fred, as if you're going to... No, 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 no. Put your feet together. Together? And now tip yourself over until you're carrying your weight right on my fist. Come on, come on, come on, come on. No, 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 no. Keep your body straight. He doesn't trust me. <laughs> come on. I won't drop you. I promise. Keep, keep tipping over. Keep tipping. <laughs> he doesn't trust me. Come on, Tim. Tip on over. I won't drop you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Tip over. Put your weight on my fist. I'll fall if I do. No, you won't, because I won't let you fall. There you go. That's what I need you to do. Now, push yourself away from my fist. That's a diaphragmatic push-up. <laughs> okay, here you go again. Now, this time, form an SH and, and blow out, but keep yourself pushed away from me. Form an S. Yeah. Like an S or an SH, something, what I'd like. Okay, now, lean on me. Lean forward. Good. Now, form an S. Keep yourself pushed away. Put, uh, oh, he's starting to go flat. His tire went flat. <laughs> you could feel it, couldn't you? Yeah. Uh, there comes a point in time where you just, you just keep that diaphragm flexed, and that's the part that most folk don't know how to do, is to learn how to keep that, that balance between what you're inhaling with and what you're exhaling with, and don't make it either or, but make them combine together. You want to try that one more time? I'm going to count to ten. You form S. I'm going to keep counting and see how far you can go. Come on, tip over. Go. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, didn't make it. But you can see that that's a challenge. And when you started to do that, you had to do some contraction. You know, he's breathing, breathing a little hard because it's actually kind of athletic. What, what you said, I'm assuming, is if you are singing, you need to let your breath come out slowly but uh, and not all at once like I was doing. You give out a breath all of a sudden. That's exactly the right answer. When you all get started, how many of you, ra by raise of hand, thanks, Fred, how many by raise of hand have plenty of breath to start the first several notes that they sing but run out by the end of the phrase? Pretty common problem. About, about 40% of you have that dilemma. And this thing that I'm showing you here is part of the solution. Now, guinea pig number three. I was hoping for a lady, but I'll take a man. It's much more fun with a lady. Okay, I'm going to just lay this down here. What I'm going to do, I've got an ace bandage here, and I'm going to wrap another Fred from Metairie. I'm going to wrap Fred around, I'm going to corset him.
Jerry Speaker. <laughs> Dizzy's gonna fall yeah. out. About <laughs> ten more revolutions to get it all in. Well, excuse me. Just think of that. That's why I decided to be funny if I had a lady here. After I'm qualified for this, any lady volunteer. Yep. Now back to he. We got Fred corseted here, trust like a turkey. Um, you can feel the pressure on the bottom of your li ribs. I've got it drawn pretty tightly. Now, keep your ribs out. Flex them out against that pressure. And as you form an SH. Now use as much breath as if, as if you were singing, but along the way, don't let that thing contract. Time out. Start again. Get your breath. And two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. <laughs> That's the, now, this costs about eight bucks. That's not hard to do at all. You can go ahead and unwrap yourself. That co that costs about eight and a half dollars. And if you're if you're having some trouble running out of breath, what you might want to do is just go to the pharmacy, buy one of these things, and wrap yourself right in your ribs before you put your clothes on. Nobody will know it's there. They'll just think you've lost some weight. <laughs> and along the way, you'll have that reminder of that contraction against which you have to resist. And the only muscle that you've got in your body that can resist that is the diaphragm. And the di diaphragm staying in a low position will cause your ribs to stay out wide at the bottom. And the trick is that most of you, when you're singing, will, you might be able to do it while you're blowing S or SH, but when you go into singing, you won't do that. Because most of you have the custom to, to cont contract and, and blow a lot of breath at certain particular moments. One of them are the f one of those moments is the very first note that you sing in each phrase after you've taken a new breath. The second one and most equally a significant moment is whenever you have to go up for a high note. And you're going singing along and all of a sudden there is the high note and your stomach contracts inwards and you may get that high note but you've got no breath left for the rest of the phrase afterwards. And it's because you've used up all of your flexibility down in your bellows right off the right from the very beginning. So those are three ways that you can do it. Um, when I'm working with my own voice students, I have a 50-pound stage weight, you know, one of those things that's used for raising lower scenery. I stole it from the theater, and I've got it in my office, and I'll get my students in, and I'll lay that 50-pound weight on their stomach, and after they've got done groaning, then I teach them how, like Rod did, and, and right immediately they get a sense that the, the controlled breathing is a good deal more vigorous than just all natural breathing. Um, this thing that I did with Fred, with him leaning against my fist, you can do to yourselves. You just get a hard-bound book, and you lean the part of the book right in your solar plexus and the other part up against the wall, and just lean into the wall, and then push yourself away from the wall by flexing your diaphragm. And then sing with your body in that position and don't allow yourself to go in toward the wall while you're, while you're singing through your phrases. So bit by bit, you can teach yourselves to be more engaged in a lower breath position. And I'm going to hold on to this, and when we get on into critiques, uh, we're going to, I'll have this available, and you'll be amazed, those of you that uh, either do it or get a chance to watch somebody else, that if somebody gets the sense of a low, controlled breath, the pressure goes off of their throats, their ease, their sing, singing becomes so much more easy that uh, it's like a miracle drug. It's a significant thing. The way you manage your breath is the single most important thing that you have to learn about singing. And if you manage your breath properly, most other problems will take care of themselves pretty readily. But if you don't manage your breath, there aren't any real easy solutions to any other problems. Range extension, volume, clarity of tone, all of them have a problem. They, they're hard to solve if you don't get the underlying breath system going first. Fred has a question. Learning, learning how to breathe in this manner, does that just, uh, eliminate the possibility of nodules uh, developing on vocal cords? It, uh, I wouldn't say it's quite that big of a cure, but it'll go a long way to making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and another occasion we'll talk about what causes nodules, but it's mostly from too much pressure. And your air is like lubricant in an automobile. It's like oil in the car. And if you don't have your air moving, you're going to create the same kind of friction that a car without enough engine oil 
creates. And just like you, you get blisters and uh, ultimately your, your, your pistons freeze up from the friction and the heat, the same thing happens in your voice box with insufficient breath flow. There's enough friction there that it can rub blisters. Blisters turn to calluses, and that's what a, a vocal note is, is a callus. It's a callus on your vocal folds. A blister is, a, they have a name for that on your vocal folds, it's called a polyp, and it's just a liquid-filled blister that's been worn on your vocal fold from too much irritation. I sing in a, a church choir, try to, and I sing tenor. And on a lot of the high notes, I feel myself trying to stretch up to get it, and my throat will tighten up. That's correct. Uh, he's describing a situation that could be re uh, remedied, at least in part, if you had better breath control. If you had bre better breath flowing, you wouldn't have to stretch so far. But that, there's more to that little issue than that. The fact that he stretches upwards for high notes is a strategy that may help him sometimes, but is most likely to hurt you as much as it's helping you. We'll come on to that in just a minute. We're going to be talking about range extension. How am I doing time-wise? i got a little stock pocket watch here. Okay, I've been blabbering here for an hour and a half hour and got about a quarter of the way through my notes. Okay, sound production. Let's get on to how you make sound. You've been doing that for a long time, and it's a pretty natural occurrence, but there are some, some things right in the way that you make your sound that are going to be really, really significant to you if you can just get the principle of it. Um, your voice box is a series of, of muscles that control two flaps of skin, and those flaps of skin can swing into an open position so that your throat is unobstructed while you're breathing, or they can swing closed and obstruct the passageway, and then when you put air through those two closed uh, flaps of skin, they begin to vibrate together, sort of like two pieces of canvas blowing in a breeze in a hurricane, except that they're more controlled than that. But those flaps of skin are your vocal folds, and they're made up of a little elastic line, a little elastic centerpiece that goes from the front of your throat to the back of your throat on either vocal cord. It's called the vocal ligament, and it's just like a rubber band that connects the front to the back. And to that is attached some muscle fiber, and overlay overlaying that is some skin called epithelium, and it's got lots of moisture on it, so it's a mucosal membrane. It's a, a lot like if you use your tongue, just feel the inside of your cheek. That's a mucosal membrane. It's a skin. It's not like the skin you have on the side. It's got a moist uh, set to it. And that same kind of skin is covering over your vocal folds. But those two flaps of skin, your vocal folds, are manipulated into open and closed positions, into being more tight or more relaxed, to being longer and shorter. There are lots of ways that they get stretched, tugged, and pulled by the muscles in your voice box. But the end result of those things is that you produce one of three kinds of sound, generally speaking. The first one is kind of tight, and it sounds bright and shrill, and it is real tense. And nobody likes to listen to somebody when they call this way because it sounds like they're mad or they're constipated <laughs> or in some other form of discomfiture. And so you don't want to you don't want to do that. And you wonder why do you have a tendency toward that? The the tight voice is generally uh, it generally stems from insufficient air movement. There's too few molecules of air moving through the vocal folds to set them into natural vibration, and so the muscles in the voice box tighten up the vocal folds to make them tighter so that it, it takes more pressure for the molecules of air to burst through and to set the vocal cords in vibration. So really, at the heart of a tight voice is an insufficiency of air movement. There's a very... Um, and so I'll leave it at that right now for just a second. The second side is this kind. This is the easy listening voice. And you hear this on the radio station uh, late at night. Or you're on certain 800 and 900 numbers if you should happen to call those. <laughs> or very similar to, similar to HAL 9000 and the... Uh yeah. yeah, the computer. That's right. It's a very mellow voice. Preachers sometimes talk like this, don't they? Garrison Keeler 
talks like this when he's talking about Lake Wobegon. And generally speaking, the origin of this problem is also insufficiency of airflow. And you say, well, how can this and this be born out of insufficient airflow? And it's simply the response of your vocal folds to the same dilemma. In the case of the mild, gentle voice, it is that there's insufficient air to really set the vocal cords into full vibration. And so there is leaking air passing through the vocal folds, which creates that nice, mellow warmth. And some people don't like that. And so not knowing that it's the breath, the problem, they tighten up their throats. And all of a sudden, it's the same quantity of air, but the result is quite different. And it, but it's the same problem. The real issue is to get enough air moving. I got a little demonstration here. You've seen it before if you've been here. This is the, uh, the Bernoulli principle or the Bernoulli effect. It's just a law of physics that says that air that's in motion creates uh, low pressure or suction. So if I blow over the top of this piece of paper, I can overcome the law of gravity like this. And you see that the, the paper rises up against the natural law of gravity because the wind blowing above the paper is sufficient to create a suction stronger than the law of gravity. Now, I, I'm going to have to do this kind of interestingly. These two pieces of paper. Hey, I'm pretty good. Thank you. These two pieces of paper represent your vocal cords in your throat. You're going to get to try this in another in a, in a moment. But they're, they're now at rest. You can see they're wide apart. And you would assume that if you blew air between them, that it would blow them further apart. But just the opposite happens if I have enough breath. You see how they're drawn together? That's that suction known as the Bernoulli principle. That principle, we see it in lots of places in our lives, but it's particularly useful to singers because if you can get a sufficiency of air moving, then you don't have to press your voice to closure. You just bring your vocal folds to a certain approximity, and then the air does the rest, and it sucks them into full closure. And if it hits, if, it, if the suction is of sufficient vigor, the vocal folds will snap all the way shut so that there's no leaking air, there's no wastage. Then the, for a very brief millisecond, the vocal folds stay closed, and while that's happening, the air from your lungs is continuing to be delivered up through the trachea. Pretty soon, the pressure to overcome that closure is great enough so that the vocal folds are blown apart so that the pressure beneath can get escaped. And as it starts to escape, immediately it creates suction and it snaps closed again. So hundreds of cycles per second, hundreds of times per second, that little vocal cycle happens between vocal folds partially open air passing through, they get sucked closed, pressure builds beneath them, blows them apart, the air passes through, they immediately get sucked closed again, and the number of those vibrations per second, the number of those so cycles, determines the pitch. 440 times a second, and that's an A natural, and about um, 470 cycles, and that's a B natural. We've learned how to calibrate that without knowing how, what it is that we're doing. We just change the numbers of cycles per second, and that's how we change pitch. Sounds so simple, doesn't it? <clears throat> it really actually is very simple if you, if you just figure it out and then get out of your own way. I thought it might be kind of fun for you all to get a chance to do a little bit of singing here and to try out that tight kind of singing and the breathy kind of singing and then the balanced kind of singing that has sufficiency of breath. Uh, would you stand up for a second? I thought we'd sing She'll Be Coming Round the Mountain. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start us out in the tight mode. Okay? So we're going to start right about there. And I want you to sing like you're really twangy. You're good at that. Thank you. And, and as we go along, I'm going to ask you to move from tight to breathy. Or pressed is another name that that's given for that tight production, to breathy. Just watch. You, you'll actually see that you can actually calibrate that. You ready? We're starting tight. Go. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Breathy. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Not too tight. 
see me coming round the mount, breathy. Round the mount. Sit breathy tight. Breathy. <laughs> well, let's try that one more time. We're starting loose this time, okay? Go. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes tight. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes loose. She'll be coming round tight. Loose. Tight. Okay, have a seat. Now, the interesting thing about that is that you were all very successful at going to those two extremes. And, and you noticed what it did to the quality of the voices? Did you notice that all of you were really good at tight? <laughs> most square dance callers tend more to that. Actually, most people who grow out of the country western heritage, of which most, most of square dance calling does, favor that kind of a sound. And you can still get that in another way without having to make your vocal cords tight. How many of you, when you sing, find your voices getting tired or tight in your voice box area when you're singing? Raise your hands. A sufficient number of you so that this is a, a worthy topic for discussion. Now, you don't want to go to either one of those two extremes too much, I don't think. Instead, you want to just increase your breath stream because I don't know if you noticed it, but when you were singing tight, the voice had lots of carrying power, didn't it? Had a had a, a focus to it that gave it energy. It also was very twangy, but it was very focused. And when you went to the breathy, it was just the opposite. It was very unfocused, but it was very warm and mellow. Are there songs that you call that would call for warm and mellow? You betcha. That's a color that you want to have access to. Are there uh, numbers where you want bright and twangy? Yes. You can use that for the, for the choices of color. You don't just have to do it because it's good or bad. It's just along a spectrum between way tight to way loose. But the best and most healthy place for you to be in your singing pattern as far as the health of your throat is to be relaxed as if you were breathy but having more air molecules moving through your throat. Now, I'm going to have you stand up for a second. Let's st stand up and let's give the, get a little bit more exercise here. I want you to start out real breathy, only each time you s sing a phrase, I'm going to ask you to increase the amount of air that moves through your throat. Now, everybody put your pinwheels back up again for a second. Blow it naturally. Now make it move fast. So when I say increase your breath, that's what I'm talking about. 30% of a fairly significant increase, okay? So we're singing, she'll be coming around the mountain one more time. Breathy. She'll be coming around the mountain. Now increase your breath. Increase your breath flow. Okay, now now you got the hang of it. Here we go, breathy again. More breath flow. Breathy. Breath. Breathy. And have a seat. Now, did you notice, if you didn't notice it in your own voice, you certainly could hear it through the room, couldn't you? The volume increased dramatically, didn't it? And not just the volume, but the clarity of the tone of the, of the whole room increased dramatically when the air increased. And the reason was that you began to use your breath more efficiently. You began to rely on that Bernoulli principle to bring your vocal cords into full closure instead of having insufficient breath, having without that sufficient suction, the vocal cords don't close with vigor, and so air leaks through. Hence, you get that kind of diffused, warm, breathy sound. Are there... Yes, here's a question. Hang on. Does everybody's diaphragm, when they, when they make it stronger like that, does it tighten up on everybody's diaphragm like that, too? Let's raise your hands. When you went to more breath, did you feel more activity going on down in your middle section. Raise your hand if you had more activity. Raise your hand if you didn't feel more activity. It's unanimous. The answer is yes. You've got more vigorous movement of breath, therefore the muscles that control the breath have to do that now more. Wouldn't you assume that by using that much more breath you'd run out of breath sooner? Wouldn't you think so? It's a lie. Stand up. Let's try it. 
What I want you to do now is I want you to sing breathy. Only at the normal places that you take a breath, don't take a breath. Just keep right on singing through and peter out when you've got no more breath left. Just keep track of where you are in your phrase to see how far you make it when, when you're singing in that warm, breathy kind of way. Here we go. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Don't breathe. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round. Now, wait a minute. Some of you guys are cheating. Some of you are taking breath. Now, sing breathy. <laughs> Go. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Keep your breath moving. This ends the front side of your cassette. Drop out when you're out. Oh, there is more truth. <laughs> the seam just kind of rolled down onto the floor. Okay, everybody kind of got a feel for where it was. You petered out this time. Now, use your breath more vigorously and see where you go. Go. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. How many of you had more, you could go longer in the song using more breath? How many of you could not? A minority, the majority of you could. Now, why in the world is that? Go ahead and have a seat. Why would you be able to sing longer using more breath? That, you have to say that again in a big, loud, undiffused voice. Less leakage around the sides. That's exactly right. Because you're getting the Bernoulli principle, you're getting a fully efficient vocal closure, so you're actually using your breath more efficiently by using it more. And so for those of you that have a tendency to have to run out of breath, my suggestion to you is use more breath. Don't use less breath. And because you will trigger your vocal cords into a more efficient activity. Now, if that's not backwards, then nothing is. But that's the truth. If you use your breath more generously, you have more breath to use. It's like love. Uh, I had surgery two years ago on my knee, and they stuck. I want to make sure we know where we're going with this before we go too far. <laughs> I had surgery on my knee. That doesn't that doesn't relate to your. You and it messed up my vocal cords, and I I couldn't even hardly talk for about three or four months, and it took about a year before I could even sing again because I'd have to take a deep breath, and as hard as I pushed out, I couldn't get any sound. Why? Oh, I got a I got a story for you now. Everybody will swap stories. Uh, I've I, that that it, yeah, I've I've been intubated the same way, and just you know the guy put the gas on me, and, and as I'm going under, I'm thinking I'll never sing again. And I ripped the mask off, and I said, "Don't do this." And my wife said, "Just be calm, just be calm." He knows, what, no, make the tube small. It's gonna hurt. And he, I went out, and I never knew any difference. <laughs> but sometimes uh, when a person goes in for surgery, they can carelessly slip the tube down into the trachea, and in so doing, they can bruise or damage uh, the vocal folds. It happens from time to time. I was involved in some voice research just recently, trying to determine what the actions of the, the muscles inside the larynx are. And so, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I went in to do what's called an EMG study, where they stick electrodes into muscles, and they can tell if the muscle is working because there's electricity that runs through it. Well, one of the muscles that they wanted to find, the trichothyroid muscles, is located right on the outside of the larynx. And so this guy took a nice, big, fat hypodermic needle and insu inserted a very fine electronic uh, copper tubing, copper wire, uh, in through the, through the thing and bent it. And he stuck the, the needle into my throat and, and fished around until he found the muscle, hooked the, hooked the electrode on there, and then withdrew the hypodermic so that the, I now had a piece of wire sticking through my skin into a muscle that was hooked up to a machine so that then when I sang uh, and went up in the pitch, which is what those muscles do, the, the, the little machine went busy, busy, busy. Well, that was fine. The second part of it was that they had to get, the mu they had to get one of these electrodes into the thyroarytenoid muscles. Now, the thyroarytenoid muscles are embedded in the vocal folds inside your voice box. 
So he had to take this hypodermic needle and he had to go right in between these two cartilages here and he kind of went in there and he fished around until he found my vocal fold and left that electrode hanging in there. And I went, I've been singing along and all of a sudden I never couldn't make any more sounds. I was in total laryngitis. And so he says, oh, I guess the experiment's over. And he went, <laughs> it was at that moment I discovered that I really wasn't a scientist at heart. <laughs> And it took me it took me about three months to recover my singing voice after that the experiment. Yours was. No breath. I could take a deep breath. I have a big set of lungs, but boy, in order to get any kind of a sound out, I had to, <laughs> and you know, just really push it. That's right, because you, because there was swelling in there, and it had to go away, and and that's all. Oh yeah, yeah, maybe even longer for some people for where that kind of vocal damage occurs. You just have rehabilitation. Well, just think about it. If you blow your knee out, do you just get up the next day and go play basketball? Heck no, it takes a long time for some things to heal, and you were in one of those conditions. Okay, now where were we? <laughs> I forgot. Oh, yeah, well, you're welcome. It, it, you thought your life was over. Never sing again. Right? Yeah. Your last actual comment was about using more air. Oh, yeah, way back on using more air. Yeah, if you use more air, you can almost make anything blow in the breeze. Your, your body, you know, referring to Ron's statement about uh, having lost his voice because of that surgery and the intubation, uh, your body has a remarkable, remarkable ability to adjust for itself um, for, and compensate for weaknesses that it has. I know a lady who had paralysis in her left vocal fold, and she was a fine singer, but when... Um, fiber optic uh, stroboscope was stuck. You, you do that by sticking the, uh, a long thin tube up through your nose and it kind of comes down and hangs down just above your voice box so you can actually see the vocal folds vibrating. Um, what would happen is that her, vocal, her right vocal fold had been trained, she'd practiced it, enough so that instead of meeting right square in the middle like they're supposed to do, where two of the vocal folds meet like that, the left one, or let's see, for you, the left one would be over here. The right one was swinging all the way over to meet with the left one in its paralyzed position. And she could still sing beautifully. There are amazing uh, adjustments that can be made. I just was part, a part of this research that I was doing. They did a lot of that sort of thing on me. And I discovered, much to my charge, that my vocal folds aren't exactly symmetrical. That uh, my, if you were going to have your vocal folds meet, ideally they'd meet right on the center line. Mine tugs a little bit off to the right which is probably explains why I'm Republican. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really. I just couldn't resist the joke. <laughs> okay, so um, now with that notion in mind, we're going to sing Come Around the Mountain one more time, only this time I'm going to call out to you tight, breathy, and balanced as we go along and see if you can find them, okay? Here you go, up. We're going to start tight. Go. She'll be coming round. Breathy. Balanced. Tight. Balanced. Okay, sit down. Could you tell the difference between those three approaches? Could, could, raise your hand if you could tell the difference between those three approaches in your own singing. Raise your hand if you could not. One, one, two, three of you, you gentlemen, maybe we'll chat a little bit afterwards. Four, sorry. Okay, for the majority of you, you now have some information that you can choose. You can choose to be balanced. Um, you can also choose to be breathy if you want to, if you're dumb enough to want to, or tight. But, you know, you can swing that back and forth a little bit, but you now know what it feels like to sing with a balanced production. Raise your hand if that balanced sound production is different than what you're accustomed to. Some few of you f will have some changing that you'll want to make in terms of the long-term good health of your singing. The rest of you are mighty content with the pressed sound, right? The tight sound. <laughs> Say again. 
I'm not content with it. That's why I'm here. I want to see if I can get rid of it. Uh, I understand. And um, generally, that little exercise, as was the case here, uh, the vast majority of folks found that to be the sufficient solution. And there were three or four of you for whom that wasn't a sufficient solution, and there's some more stuff that could be done along that with the, with the four of you if you want to stop up for a second afterwards. You betcha. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, those who sound breathy as a natural way can they like yourself no not really but those who do uh is there a way for them to change you betcha and we just explored it and that is to increase their breath flow that's a sing it's the single solution that sort of addresses that all the time uh the best um there are often emotional reasons why people don't do that the people that were raised in a home where children were seen but not heard find it very difficult to make a sound that is in the slightest degree assertive or aggressive. They have, a, they have a tendency to always want to be mild. How successful? Do, do those kind of people have trouble commanding a square? Yeah. In the way that they make their voice sound, they say, do this if it's okay with you. Is everybody in agreement with that? Okay, let it, that solid man left, okay? And by that time, you've got mutiny on your hand because there's... <laughs> and so there really is, uh, there is, um, for many folks, a psychological uh, block against being assertive. And yet, you don't have to be assertive. You just have to use your breath and then not be, em not be embarrassed by the sound that comes out of your mouth. You don't have to sing and then say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. And that's what it feels like for those folks on the inside of them. Whenever they take command, their first desire is to say, I didn't really mean it. I'm sorry. Now do what you want to. I don't want any conflict here. And, uh, and it's a, it can be a real significant issue. So I don't mind, mean to make light of it. I just am saying that often it's not just a simple process of biomechanics. It's a process of adjusting your thinking processes to say that when you're on the podium calling the dance, you're in charge and you have to make your voice sound like it's in charge. And if you don't know how to do that, you'll have a tendency to press it. And then you'll go too far the other way and the sound will be harsh and commanding and irritating. But if you just increase your breath stream, then all of a sudden the sound is easy to listen to, like as if it were breathy, except that it's not. It's now efficient, you don't run out of breath, and you know the best thing of all? You don't get tired. That's worth a lot. All of those things can stem from just using your breath more efficiently, more generously. If you are doing a real twangy song and you want to do that twang sound, how do you do that without forcing it? The truth of the matter is, is that when you want to create that, you do. You create that sound just like I did. It's one. It's a choice of will. And I can go there. I don't want to go there very long because I get tired. And there are some other ways that you can create that sound. Uh, but the, the first and foremost way is to just sing tight, slightly tight, okay? Now, another question, hang on here. Would you come to the microphone? Uh, two questions. One is clearing the throat, and number two is, for a while I played with the harmonica, and I found it really did a lot for exercising the diaphragm. So those of you who want to do like that and still make music, it's a fun way to go. Try playing the harmonica, because you just use your breath both inward and outward. You can tell I haven't done it for a while because my voice is breathy. <laughs> yeah, the harmonica is a good way. You can play the kazoo. You can do a number of things like that. They would be a lot of fun. Playing the radio doesn't really help too much. <laughs> but the, the other question had to do with clearing your throat. Can I hold on to that a little bit later on? And if I don't get it done, then you beat me up afterwards, okay? Let's move on. Oh, yes. Um, in the words of enunciation, as far as forming your words, uh, with your breath control, is it, uh, does it make any difference? Uh, it actually does not. Uh, it's just as easy, in some respects easier to keep your air moving than having it tight. Part of the reason I say that is that when a person uses insufficient breath, frequently it isn't just the muscles that are in the larynx that are tight to create uh, more uh, a more efficient sound with the insufficient of the breath flow and you get that tight sound. But frequently, the base of the tongue will also get stiff 
and the jaw will get stiff as a means of trying to stabilize against this sort of increasing pressure that one feels in the voice box. And as soon as the jaw and the tongue get stiff, then enunciation gets terrible. Uh, and the tongue, which normally should be very flexible to move around in the mouth to form all of the different vowels, no longer can do that because part of it is stiff trying to do another jaw back in the throat for which it wasn't originally designed. And then when it starts to get tight, then the jaw starts to get tight. And, and frequently, people's jaws will get tight as they go higher in the scale. Does that sound familiar to anybody? And so as they go higher in the scale, their jaw gets kind of locked, and then it gets really hard to enunciate your words. Now, just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about here, close your mouths and hum, only hum as if you were humming the letter E. Mm. Notice where your tongue is in your mouth. Now, hum a U vowel. Mm. Did you notice your tongue's in a different position? Did you ever know that? You know, your tongue moves around a lot. Now, hum an A. Mm. Hum an O. Mm. Your tongue adjusts to all kinds of different positions. And I'm just having you hum because it isolates your tongue in an odd position. You're not used to humming with vowels at all. So it puts your tongue in a strange place so that you can, you can realize what it is that you're doing. But you'll notice your tongue has to move around to all of those different positions very quickly in order for us to understand our language. It's just the vowels. But by the same token, if you start throwing consonants into the middle of all that, the tongue has to be flexible to go up and touch the roof of the mouth, to touch the teeth. Um, and if, it, if it's stiff at its stem, then the tongue will have a tendency to draw backwards off of the teeth, and it becomes very difficult to see, could say consonant like D's and T's and L's because the tongue has a hard time jutting forward because it's busy being drawn backward by the stiffness at the base of the tongue. So I would say in answer to your question that uh, airflow that makes the vocal, the mo vocal sound more efficient can release tension in the tongue and in the jaw and leave the, the, those articulators free to do their job more efficiently. One more question. Yes, I have another question. Since I've had that problem, if I try to drop my volume down for a particular song, parts of it go way down. If I try to drop my voice way down, it starts cracking. Yeah, now Ron's going to be a really good example here because he, he emphasizes one aspect of his voice to the exclusion of the other aspects of his voice, and, and that's kind of where we're going to go next. This that we're touching on now, range extension, and that which will come next, um, voice quality, are going to be the heart and soul of our next session. But I'm going to just touch an overview on it now for those of you that, for whom this is only going to be the only time that you'll be able to be here. Let me just check my notes here for a second. In, in the human voice, we have, in our, in our voice box, we have um, the ability to shift gears somewhat like an automobile shifts gears. We have a light voice that would be relatively corresponding to overdrive or to third gear in a standard shift automobile. And those of you that drive standard, what is the characteristic that most often is associated with third gear or fourth gear? Speed, not much, not much strength, high, uh, it relieves the pressure on, on the revolutions per second uh, by recalibrating the gear, but there's not much torque on the, on the third and fourth gears. Is that about right? Okay, now what about first gear? Can't go very fast, but plenty of torque. And the human body has those same characteristics, only it's not with interlocking gears. It's just a different system. We have in our voices... Uh, a heavy voice, Ron's voice, and a light voice. And I don't know who might be an, uh, a model of that light voice, but we have a light voice. And most of the men in the room are used to using the heavy voice almost to exclusion. But there are um, heavy voice, light voice, and then there's a mixture between those. So there's basically three kinds of voices that you can use when you're singing. The heavy voice sounds like Ron's voice. Yeah. I get a little more than that. Okay. Uh, real hard pushing. Yeah. All right. So 
you can hear what are what are the characteristics of Ron's voice first and foremost it's low what what other characteristics does the heavy voice have power torque that you can hear it you can sort of feel that it's powerful uh, does it have limitations Ron knows what they are yes it does it's pitch it's pitch and volume if, if you're wanting something that's powerful you stay in the heavy voice and it generally is most comfortable in the low range and becomes increasingly uncomfortable the higher you go in the range how many of you find yourselves limited on the top of your voice by an inability to reach up to those upper notes how many of you find challenges to yourself that you can reach the high notes as long as you're blasting it out full volume but if you ever have to sing less than full volume you can't make the notes you guys are the ones that are driving in first gear get off the highway learn how to shift gears and you'll be just fine <laughs> are, are there any of you who who uh, would characterize yourselves as using the light voice most of the time anybody want to volunteer for that the characteristics of the light voice maybe I'm not sure yeah that's correct you hear the gentility of Tony's voice there's an easiness now Tony say that maybe I'm not, I'm not sure but this time use 30 percent more air than you did before maybe I'm not sure all right so all of a sudden it got a little more efficient a little bit more power but it was still light and the characteristic you notice I'm not saying high and low voice because it's possible to use the light voice down low and the heavy voice up high but uh, they they're relatively limited in their use the light voice can go up here quite easily it just does it naturally except that most of us guys are afraid of our feminine side and so we don't use it very often <laughs> and so uh, the light voice is gentle our wives would like it a lot more if we would use the light voice um, it's it's also has the ability to go upwards in range higher but it is not characteristically powerful and so you can see how that could be very very useful to have the heavy voice is also extremely useful to have because it's so commanding uh, the, the heavy voice generally vibrates in your chest right Ron that's very true you can feel it yeah you you can feel it on yourselves when when he talks you can feel it vibrate in your own chest if I could get glory up here you know, Gloria also uses her heavy voice a lot and you can feel that it vibrates in her chest a lot <laughs> that didn't go on tape and I'm not going to repeat it <laughs> except to say that some dreams never do come true <laughs> okay uh, where was I <laughs> chest voice yeah the heavy the heavy voice has a tendency to vibrate vigorously right underneath the sternum the light voice has a tendency to not vibrate in the chest at all where is it vibrating it's in my head no it's I don't feel anything in my throat I feel it up in my head right and I'm I'm, I'm not changing genders I'm just changing registers um, and and so the, the those extremes can be used to affect but the most useful is the intermingled voice that where you have characteristics of the heavy voice and the light voice together so the human voice really has three gears or three registers the modal register or the chest register or the heavy register and the light register and the mixed register you can find that for yourselves by standing up go ahead please I would like you to count to five in a quiet conversational voice go one two three four five you all feel it vibrate regardless of your gender you can feel it vibrate underneath your sternum okay that's kind of the low voice now use the the actor's voice you're on the Shakespearean stage now let's count to five one two three four five 
Good. Uh, I won't have you go to the head because it's a, a strange city and we don't want to go ahead and have a seat. <laughs> Although you might, some of you might just want to stay on and take over for those impersonators that are in that one show. But what happened to you when you went on into that uh, more declamatory or dramatic voice? The vibration moved upwards so that you had sensations both in your chest and in your head. And that's correct. You had an intermingling of those two characteristics. The raised pitch has to do with the light voice because it's the light voice that's responsible for lifting pitch, raising pitch. Those of you who have trouble extending your pitch upwards, it's because the muscles that control pitch inflection, the light voice musculature, is either unpracticed, not strong, or you're psychologically blocked to be able to use it. You get these same guys sitting in front of a football game on TV, and they're up there all the time! And, and yet you get them in front of a crowd to sing, and they go, oh, no, I can't do that. And so there are some, there are some psychological things, that you know, some sociological, some culture things that keep us from um, accessing that range, guys. So get over it. Find the, find the feminine side of yourself and let it have full flower. But you notice that as you went into your, um, inflected your stage speech, it had the power, it has the same power that the low voice is, but it, it now has pitch inflection. So you're able to go at highway speeds without burning your transmission out. And re really, that's kind of what the truth is. The person who goes up there this way can't get up to highway speeds and is really worn out by the time he's finished one tip. You all know what I'm talking about. You've heard people struggle that way. Okay, so I think it might be kind of fun to find ways to, f to access those different qualities in your voice. So let's do, let's do a little experimenting. Will you all stand up? Yeah. Yeah, you thought this was voice lessons. This is actually knee exercises. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay, the first thing that I want you to do, we're going to try to find, uh, access the light voice. And I want you to count to five in your most tender voice. One, two, three, four, five. This is the way you used to talk to your wife. This <laughs> the way that you talk to your grandchildren when they're behaving. <laughs> right. So we have, gentlemen, we have access to this voice we just don't usually associate it with anything else except for the tender voice. And that's really the place where we use it most readily is when we're trying to be tender. And it needn't be very high. It can be kind of low, but it's still that tender, gentle voice. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain, she'll be coming round the mountain, she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Notice how easy that was? How easy on your throat? Did you also notice that even though it was quiet, it was not breathy? It's still efficient. Do it again. Only this time keep that 30% of breath energy, but in the light, tender voice. Go. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Keep your breath up. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain. She'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. Okay, now that's your light voice. That's also the voice that you can go higher in pitch with. And if you stay there... Oh, by the way, where is that vibrating? Is it somebody somewhere... Gestures are sort of somewhere in here. Something like that. <laughs> no, it's, it's here in the upper part of the throat, up into the face. Any vibrations in your chest? No. No, there aren't. The, the vibration patterns, the way your vocal cords are uh, configured, they don't gender that, those intense vibrations down into your chest when you're in a light voice. Now, in that light voice, do this for me. Whee! Wee! Wee! No, no, you don't go into falsetto. Stay in that tender voice. Here we go. I'm going to kind of give you pitches. Wee! No, you didn't, mit you didn't match it. Wee! 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 Now 
you can go wee, wee, wee all the way home. Is that a new sensation for anybody? Raise your hand if that's a new sensation for you. Okay, that's a legitimate sound. That's a legitimate singing sound. It can be used uh, in its isolation, and it's very effective for helping you to extend your range upwards. Here's another way to do that. Hum. Mm. Mm. And here's an intermingling exercise. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, 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 yum. The food's getting better, you can tell. Yum, 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 yum. 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 I'm going to stay there until you get it. Yum, 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 yum. 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 See, you're getting there, and you notice that that isn't. Now, now go use your falsetto voice right there. Yum, 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 yum. That's a way different voice, isn't it? Okay, that other voice is the male head voice. And it's, it works. But that chewing exercise is so valuable because it takes your jaw muscles and your tongue muscles, which, if you've ever thought about it, the primary purpose for your jaw and your tongue is not for talking, but for eating, for chewing, and swallowing. So if you, that sort of yum, 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 allows those muscles to be involved in their natural activities gets them out of the way, and allows the throat to be free to find its own uh, inflection in that high range. Let's do that one more time. So when you are traveling to a dance, one of the very best vocal exercises you can do in the car while you're traveling is this little chewing exercise. Um, let's do the drill one more time. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, 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 yum. Take note of where the sensations are as you do this. Yum, 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 yum. Now, was there anybody that had trouble with that? That sounded so easy, and that's higher than most of you sing. And you're saying, really? Gosh, that wasn't hard at all. It didn't hurt at all. Well, right, you're in the correct gear. That's where you work. Okay, here we go again. Yum, 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 yum. 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 Yum, And again. Yum, 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 yum. All right, that's very good. That gives you a way to get at your sound. She'll be coming round the mountain only chewing. Yum, 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 yum. Yum, 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 yum. Now in a new key. Yum 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 That's way higher than most of the tips that you'll ever call. Go ahead and have a seat. Actually, the words that go to that verse is we're going to kill the red rooster. Yum, yum, you know, it's that verse. So that's the access to the upper voice. Is that hard? No, it's not hard. It, mostly, it's psychologically or sociologically hard to allow yourself. But you're a bunch of macho guys, and you're in with the other guys, and you're making that sound, and all of a sudden, it isn't hard at all. It really isn't hard at all. You just have to access the right range. How many of you have trouble not being able to reach low notes? One, two, three, four, about, about eight or nine of you. There are some ways. Generally, that part of singing hasn't been as explored as the range extension upwards because more people have to figure out how to go upwards than to go downwards. But increasingly, there are people who are saying, gee, I wish I had more depth to my voice. I wish I had lower notes. And the truth of the matter is that it, you, there are some things that you can do to extend your range downward. It's been a kind of an interesting thing. It was actually Gloria a number of years ago that kind of 
I got on my case as it related to lady callers. I kept trying to spend my time with the men, helping them get into their upper voice. And she says, no, 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 no. The ladies don't know, don't need to go in their head voice more. They need to go into their chest voice more because they sound too shrill on their recordings. And I, I was a little troubled by that. I mean, I didn't want to cross Gloria, but yeah. But, uh, but I still, it, it puzzled me. And I got to thinking, now, how, how do you deal with that? And it's been very interesting that over the last two years, um, I've had some students at the university who can't access their low range the way they should. They just wimp out on the bottom of their voices. And so I've scratched my head, and uh, there just isn't anything written in the literature about how to extend low range. But I've come up with some ideas that I'd like to share with you that may be useful to you. Uh, those of you that have that challenge, will you kind of come on up here to the front? We're going to use you as uh, training models. While they're coming up, I, I bypassed one segment that I want to do. Let's get you over here in this corner. Uh, remember, I, I wanted you to find out what the Bernoulli principle felt like in your own body. And you can do that by doing a lip trill. If you start this way, with your lips about an eighth or a quarter of an inch apart, and then introduce a, a vigorous stream of breath, you'll, dip your li you'll create a raspberry. <laughs> but you have to start with your lips apart. You can't put them together first. And then if you get a sufficiency of airstream, then I ask you the question, why did your, why did your lips start buzzing? Why did they not just simply go <laughs> <laughs> And that is because of once you hit that minimum threshold of energy, even lips will get sucked into a closed position. So I wanted you to feel that sensation. Incidentally, that's a pretty good way for some of you to practice when you are not accustomed to having uh, enough air flowing in your vo own voice. If you've run out of breath too soon, then if you will sing you'll be amazed because you'll sing along and all of a sudden it will the lip trill will stop and it stops because there isn't enough air to keep it trilling anymore so you go and it's a dead giveaway that at that moment subconsciously you cut off your airstream and it's not enough to keep your lips trilling so that's an excellent excellent way to train yourselves to sing with a, a sufficiency in your breath okay here are men that want to become real men, and we're going to show them ways to do that. One of the... Cha I'm sorry, that's a, just a joke. Um, <laughs> one of the ways to do that is to pretend uh, to start your engine, to rev your engine. Uh, 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 uh. You, you did this when you were children. I did, to play cars. Yeah, now as you do that, uh, 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 where does it vibrate? Do it. Where does it vibrate? Down in your chest, right? That means that they're gaining access to their chest voice. That chest voice is the means whereby you get down low. It requires a uh, significant amount of relaxation to do that. Let's go one more time individually, Mike. Now, can you... Uh, let's go on to the next one. This is... Very good. Hey, okay, Mike. Yeah, good. You can hear he's graveling a little bit. Just now, do that one more time because this is going to be instructive, Mike. You don't mind me making an example of you. Now, if you were to characterize that as breathy, pressed, or balanced, what would you characterize it as? Pressed. And pressed requires tightness, and tightness does not allow for the relaxation required for the low notes to come. There's an easiness. So that may not be the best solution for you right now. Let's keep looking for some other ones. But now drop it low. This is a Mack truck. Yeah, or at least, at least a Dodge Ram, right? Okay, so that's one way that you can do that, you gentlemen and anybody else that's trying to do that. You just rev your engine. Try it yourself. Mm -hmm. Good. And then as you do that, you let it rumble in your chest and don't inhibit that. I'm going to move down scale with you guys. Would you go? 
You guys, you're close. You're sort of you're sort of rubbing your legs together like a cricket to get that sound. <laughs> now there's another there's another way that you can do this, and you access the heavy voice. You access the heavy voice by making loud sounds. That's the other function of the heavy mechanism is volume. So, will you do this for me? Ha! Huh. Ha. Ha. Again. Ha. 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 Now sustain. Ha. ha. Did anybody feel discomfort in your throat? Good. And one more time. Ha. ha. Good. Those are those are tools. Go ahead and have your seat. Those are some tools that can be used to find the the sensations that go along with the low voice and they rumble in the chest and for some individuals uh, many women and some men don't ever access that low voice and so it's a completely unexplored range for them and has to be uh, sort of uh, tricked into existence here's another way that you can do it this is called the nasty drill nyam 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 lower nyam 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 Keep it nasty. Nyam 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 nastier. Nyam 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 nyam. Good. And you, as you do that, by making that really bright nasty sound, you get all of the pressure off of the back of your throat and can set up a condition where the vocal folds can vibrate actually very freely in a bright frequency rather than a swallow dark frequency okay so those are two tools that you might use if you're having trouble extending your range downwards okay how are we doing on time i've lost my when what time are we supposed to stop here three o'clock at what at three o'clock okay <laughs> summarize uh, no um so we, we got through, that some of the range extension. Well, let's just finish up range extension just a little bit. Um, uh, there are a couple of other, no, I'll save those. For the next time, next time I'll save those drills that have to do with how to really get more and more access. We'll just use this as an overview. The last part of the thing that I want to talk about, I'm going to go very quickly over, and that is your uh, voice quality. We have already seen that right in the way that you make your vocal sound, you can either make the sound very bright or very warm, tight or loose. And it changes the quality of the voice from this mellow quality to this breathy mellow quality to this tight quality to this shrill quality to this irritating quality. You can, do, you can play that by degrees of relaxation and looseness right in the voice box itself. Above and beyond that, however, there are some other things that you can do by bringing your sound very forward in your mouth or very dark in your mouth. Those of you who been in this session before know the, the five-point drill. The first one, you place your hands right across the tip of your nose and around the corners of your mouth like thus, and you don't let any sound go back inside the tool. It's all the way out on the front. Okay, can you count to five with me? I will do it once and then you join me. One, two, three, three, three. Go. One, two, three, four, five. Well, some of you didn't do so very well because the O vowel normally wants to go O back in your mouth. But if you keep it out front, you sound sort of like a Chinook. <laughs> you know, the, the ones that say about and they don't ever go O, oh, they don't let it go back in their mouth too far. That, but actually that, or you sound like a, you know, an Inspector Clizu. And, you know, it's that kind of sound that grows out of a pretended French accent. That's, nobody ever uses that except for, for a caricature. The second position, however, is right across the bridge of your nose, across your frown smile lines, whichever way you look at those, 
and you allow the sounds to, to slip a little bit deeper inside your mouth. And they go from yin chi 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 to one, two, three, four, five. Then right at the edge of your eyes, one, two, three, four, five. Back, one, two, three, four, five. And behind your ears, one, two, three, four, five. And that's a good way to drop your IQ. Okay, now that's, I'm sorry that the, the last little segment got short shifted, but it is range extension and voice quality that will be part of the next section that we'll get started with at 3.30. Thank you all very much for being here.